Shri Maski. <clears throat> For those online, they can follow the slides. Verse 31 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Let's just commit this time to the Lord. Lord, we thank you for your precious word. These are words that are true and words that is alive. May it speak to each of our hearts this morning. And Lord, if there are things that we need to confess, need to bring before you for forgiveness, I ask that you'll just convict us. The Holy Spirit this morning work in each heart. I pray that in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So the first... Um, uh, the, slide. the first slide, next one, I found this comic. You all know this comic of Charlie Brown, or Peanuts. Now, this is actually August 1959, if you want to know the date. I didn't know that Peanuts was started in the 30s, 1930s, so you can go and look that up. But one of, one of the, this cartoon, Linus, wins, uh, bends his hostility by throwing rocks into a vacant lot, okay? And while he throws the rocks, he says, he shouts out the following, he says, this is for all the nasty things they say about George Washington, he throws the rock. And then he says, this is for the people who hate little kids, and he throws, throws the rock. And this is for people who kick dogs, and he throws the rock. This is for the hot summer nights, he throws the rock. And this is for the cold, white, uh, for cold winter mornings. He throws a rock. And this is for lies and broken promises. He throws another rock. And then he turns to Charlie Brown and asks him, do you have any requests? Now we're continuing this morning. In the second half of the book of Ephesians, uh, with our series that I call the second half walk. This is the practical side. The first three chapters of Ephesians was the theology, the doctrine, um, teaching us who we are in Christ. And then the last three chapters, we learn about not only who we are, but how we are to be who we are. If I can say it that way. How to be who we are in Christ. So it's talking about also this idea, and we've spoken about this a few weeks now, taking off and putting on. Putting on clothes, putting off clothes. And um, we see this in, continue in, in chapter 4, verse 22, Paul says, put on the old self, put off the old self. Verse 24, he says, put on the new self. And since God has saved us, since God has made us a new creation, the old self doesn't fit anymore. It doesn't fit anymore. And it's not compatible with who we are in Christ Jesus. And I believe that is how we overcome sin in our lives and, and uh, many uh, things of the old man, is to put on the new and take off the old. That's how Paul explains this. And we've seen that, um, just to reflect back, we've seen that the new man is truthful. He doesn't speak falsehood. He doesn't lie. The new man reflects Jesus, who is the truth. There's no falsehood in Jesus. And that's what we must reflect as believers. We also saw that the new man gets angry, but he doesn't sin. So I see a relief on some faces when I say that. But you shouldn't sin and you shouldn't, um, uh, your anger should be short-lived. Because the sun shouldn't go down on your anger. Remember that? That was two weeks ago, I think. Anger management. So we did some anger management in the church. Is it working? <laughs> Who, fight, who, who fought this morning on, the, on your way to church? Uh -huh. we, we spoke about truthfulness and I'm, I'm worried now. So last week we continued by asking the question and I, I, break, I broke it up just to make it easy to understand. Are you a giver or a taker? Remember that? Are you a giver or a taker? Are you a builder or a breaker? Now, um, 
also all of this that we've, we've studied is in the context of relationships and especially the church we starts chapter four with unity biblical unity and how we should preserve the unity of of the spirit um and then he he gives it breaks this down it's all in the context of relationships so the new man is someone that gives it's someone and i'm not talking about money i'm talking about relationship he gives in relationship he adds value to relationship he sees the need of others and he shares what he has with them he ministers to them and i did put a challenge out there i don't know who of you did it if you come to church what can you do for someone else how can you minister to someone maybe just ask them how you're doing are you well can i pray for you anything um and then in contrast to that, the new man, uh, to the new man, the old man depletes. Now you've, you've met those people. They deplete your relationship. They are busy at work, but busy body. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11. They steal your time. They steal your energy. Always creating problems. Always taking, 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 but never giving. Have you met those people? They drain you. Okay? And it's in the context of the church. Now, I know this doesn't happen in this church. It only happens in East London. Okay? It doesn't happen here. Okay? But you get those people. They just drain you. And we should put the new man on and take the old man off. Now, the next question that we looked at last week is, are you a builder or a, or a breaker? And I said, um, Paul says that the way we do this is with our words. Verse 29. There shouldn't be corrupt words that comes out of your mouth, but words of grace, words that builds up, words that encourage. And these things, if we don't do them, if we break down, if we take, if we are false, if we anger and sin, these things grieve the Holy Spirit. Now today I'm going to ask another question, and, I'm, and it's in the title. Are you, a, are you better or bitter? I'm not saying better than other people, not in that context. But are you putting better clothes on or better clothes, basically, if I can put it that way? Do you live with, I don't know if this word exists in the dictionary, but I made it up, betterness. Do you live with betterness or do you live with bitterness? The new man should be better, not bitter. And again, Paul talks this in and he says this in the context of the church and in the context of relationships. We know the church is not a building. We know the church is a people. It's us. We come together. And as long as we, uh, as there are people, and let me tell you this, I've been 21 years in ministry. And I've realized this very, very soon in my ministry is you work with people and the church consists of people and people are not perfect. And as long as you have people, there will be times that you will get offended. You will get offended. I'm sorry to give you the bad news. When I'm not wearing the right garment, I'm going to offend you. I'm going to say things maybe or do things, act in, in a way that sh I shouldn't have, that offends people. And you need to know this, that every one of us will have our moments. That morning we woke up and we forgot to put on the new man and we put on the old man. And then we come to maybe do to church, say something not nice, not kind, not friendly. And we offend someone. If it wasn't so, and I know this only happens in West London, East London. It doesn't happen here. But if, if this happens, why, if this doesn't happen, why would Paul say to us, Forgive one another, if that wasn't true. So I'm so glad I'm part of an imperfect church. Hello. Because, it, well, if you're looking for the ideal church, stay away because you know, I might mess it up. You go. So verse 31 describes the old clothes, the old man's clothes. Verse 32 describes the new man's clothes. And I called it bitter clothes and better clothes. Does it make sense? So let's look at the first one, bitter clothes. Verse 31. Verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all 
matters. Now, each word has got so much meaning, but there's just not enough time to talk about all of them. And Paul, Paul names six, let me say, call it pieces of clothing that describes the old man, that describes the sinful self. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, malice. He says, put this all away from you. Now, bitterness is mentioned first, and I do think there's a reason why. Because it's from bitterness that the other attitudes that are mentioned flows. Wrath, anger, clamor, slander, malice comes from bitterness. Hebrews 12 verse 15 says that bitterness is like a leaven that spreads and defiles. Now, I love to go into the Greek, so I'm going to give you the Greek of these words. Are you okay with that? The first one, bitterness is pikra. P-I-K-R-A. Pikra. It literally means sharp, like the point of a, um, a spear. When you eat something bitter, it has a sharp taste. That's why they call it picra sharp. Picria also describes a plant that produces poisonous, uh, poisonous fruit. Now the Greeks define this, if you go in what they, that when they spoke about picria, they define the word as a long-standing resentment. Now, the New Testament uses this word they, uh, metaphorically to describe hostility that poisons the inner man. Just think about this. Bitterness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. Think about it. It's drinking poison and hoping that the other person will something happen to you. That's bitterness. It does more damage to yourself than the other person it makes you sour it makes you crabby it infuses your mouth your, your tongue your words with venom and the bitter person harbors resentment he keeps score of everything paul says you shouldn't keep score and this is the opposite of love that will always find a way to cover the multitudes of sin. That's what love does. Bitterness is the opposite. Now, Virsbeer is a commentary that I read, says the following. He says, bitterness in the heart makes us treat others the, the way Satan treats them. When we should treat others the way God has treated us, in his gracious kindness, God has forgiven us and we should forgive others. And then Martin Lloyd-Jones says, bitterness is a state of the spirit. It denotes a sort of persistent sourness and an absence of amiability. Is that how you pronounce it? Amiability. Amiability. Mm. You'll have to learn Afrikaans because we're going to speak Afrikaans in heaven. It is an unloving condition. It is an unloving condition. Indeed, it is a condition which ne never sees any good in anything. But always contrives to see something wrong or some defect and deficiency. This is a bad place to be. But, but, but. But pastor, you don't know what happened to me. You don't know what they said to me. You don't understand how they hurt me and slandered me and made uh, bad and evil remarks to me. But listen, by nursing your grievance, your grievances and dwelling on them, you will allow it to spring up a root of bitterness. Maybe you have been dealt a few blows in life. I think we all have. All have been hurt by many people. But it is worse. It is worse than to allow bitterness to poison your soul. Now, M.P. Green, I, first time I read this person, 
he says, and this, this was so profound, so I thought, let me read this. He says, self-pity weeps on the devil's shoulder. Turning to Satan for comfort. His invitation is, come unto me, all you that are grieved, peeved, misused and disgruntled and I will spread on the sympathy. You will find me a never failing source of the meanest attitudes and the most selfish sort of misery at my altar. You may feel free to fail and fall. And there is no sigh and fret. I will feed your soul on tears and indulge your ego with envy and jealousy bitterness and spite there i will excuse you from every cross duty and hardship and permit you to yield unto temptation man i read this many times it's it just describes exactly what bitterness is bitter people are sad people have you met them they sad people they make themselves miserable and they make the people around them miserable. Paul says, put, put that away from me. It doesn't fit. It's not compatible with your new nature. This is not who you are. Philippians 4 verse 4 says, rejoice in the Lord always. I say rejoice. That's who we are. That's what Christians are. We are joyful people. Not fearful people. Not bitter people. Then if you continue to look at the cartoon, and I put the next one on. This is August, October, November 1959. I saw this one. It says, it says, it says when, when Linus now threw the rocks, okay? He says, I've decided that throwing rocks is no solution. Person just need to learn to develop self-control. Only an idiot could be convinced that throwing rocks into a vacant lot will solve his problems. And let me tell you, I agree. Don't let psychology tell you, you must go in a corner, put a pillow on your face and scream as loud as you can. It's going to take away your anger. It doesn't. You need to put off the old man. You need to put on the new man. That's how you deal with this. A man who had car trouble on a lonely road asked the farmer to tow him to the nearest garage. So the farmer took him on their way to this garage. His wife was protesting to her husband because of the fee that the farmer charged. It is scandalous, she said. To charge ten dollars to take us three miles to the garage and the husband then replied never mind i'm having my revenge i've got my brakes on he's doing damage to his to his own car oh you know people are stupid and this is what bitterness do to you you do the stupid, stupidest thing just to get back. Let's look at the next word is wrath. It's the, it's the Greek word thumos. I'm not going to go into the details where you get thermometer and all those different. But it literally means moving violently. Moving violently. That's wrath. Hebrews 11, 27, we see this word. Describe Pharaoh's murderous fury at Moses. Lucas, uh, Luke 4, 28, 29 describes the fury, thumos, of the Jews in the synagogue at Nazareth when they decided they're going to throw Jesus off a cliff. They were furious. The, Greek, the, the Greeks defined thumos as the kind of anger which is like the flame which comes from straw quickly blazes and just as quickly subsides it's like an explosion boom and it's gone thumos is like that now i know some of the commentary says explosion they define it as that 
it quickly, you hear it once, it's gone, but the damage. Have you seen those people? I know it doesn't happen to you. It only happens with other people. No? I'm not going to blame East London again. Let's blame Brock Pines. They, they, they explode and it's gone, but then you see the damage left behind. Now, bitterness leads to wrath. Bitterness is what happens on the inside. Wrath is the explosion on the outside. But it leaves terrible scars. It hurts those around you. Anger again is the word ogre. It literally means to become red in the face. That's what it means. Have you seen that? I'm not going to try it. It might pop up. <laughs> but they get so angry, they get red in their face. That's what anger means in Greek. And um, we saw the same word in verse 23 when Paul says, get angry, but don't sin. But we know in the context what he says it. He says it's, it's not wrong to get angry, but you shouldn't nurse that anger. Okay, you shouldn't let it spring up in bitterness and you should deal with it quickly. Don't let go to bed angry. Now, I've, I've tried to practice this in my marriage for almost 20 years. I know I've failed a few times, but don't go to bed angry. It's the best advice you can ever give to a married, married couple. Don't go to bed angry. Am I right? Am I right? How do you feel when you go to bed angry? Miserable. Man, you can't sleep and, and everything just goes wrong. Now, it is not wrong to get angry, but when you sin. And the difference is when becoming angry turns into this anger that you carry around with you. And Paul says, don't go to bed. Now, clamor literally means an outcry or a loud cry. Referring to shouting. Have you seen an angry, angry person? His volume goes up and he starts shouting. And when we get angry and when we start to raise our voice, you know what? That, this is not the old, the new man. This is the old man. This is what Paul describes. It doesn't belong to the new man, it doesn't fit. Clamor, well, I say here, say here that shouting to each other will never solve any problem. I, I can agree. It doesn't solve anything. It's just adding petrol to the fire. And then the word slander, a very interesting Greek word is blasphemia. You remember that? You recognize that? Blasphemy. Blasphemia, that slander literally comes, it comes from two words, blacto and feme. Blacto meaning to speak, uh, um, uh, to, to injure, to hurt, and feme to speak. You speak words that hurt, to injure. You speak things to injure. Now, we know we, we, we see this word refers many times in the Bible when people say things to God and they say things to hurt his reputation, to make him bad, to make him evil, and that is blasphemy, to speak hurt or injury. The words, and I've said this last week, the way we break down is by our words. The words we speak. Speaking evil. Slander is not part of the new man. Slander breaks down. Gives the, gives the devil an opportunity. Listen to what Proverbs 26 says. It says verse 20, For lack of word, the fire goes, sorry, can I just say this? The zeal, this is fast, but it's not the So I'm picking on her today. She can be angry with me and forgive me tonight. But she, she said yesterday something and it said, but you can't say that. Remember that, Giselle? It was this. So she knows what this is about. Proverbs 26 verse 20 says, for lack of word, the fire goes out. And where there is no whisperer, quarreling ceases. As charcoal to hot embers and wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome man for kindling strife. The words of the whisperer are like delicious morsels. Is it that? Morsels. They go down into the inner parts of the body. Now, 
Sometimes we just need to shut up. Even if we feel we need to say something, we need to just say nothing. Okay, that's the point. So, <clears throat> and just before you feel guilty about all these things, just before you say, oh, I'm this bad person and it's so bad, Paul adds something else. He talks about malice. Put all these away. And together with that, also malice. The malice is kind of the baddest word. It's wickedness. It's just evil. It's ill towards someone else. Actually, I, I, I can't remember, but I read somewhere in Greek that it means to desire to, for someone to, something bad to happen with someone. Is that right? Malice. That's malice. Thank God. Thank God Paul doesn't stop here with the negative, with the bitter clothes. Thank God he shows us the bitter clothes. And you need to choose. What are you wearing? Better clothes or better clothes? Let's look at better clothes. Are you ready? Okay. Verse 32. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgave us. He only names three things. Now, I, I do think you, can, you cannot truly deal with the negative. Maybe you're struggling with some of these things we talked about. But you can't, cannot deal with the, the, this effectively without the positive. Okay? At the same time. When the Christian gets rid of all these things, he makes room for new qualities to develop in his life. And when you put on the new self, you know what happens? There's no space for the old things. So it's actually at the same time, you need to put on the new things and then obviously the old self cannot also be entertained. Galatians 5, verse 16. You all know this text. It says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So it doesn't help if you try to just get rid of all the things in your life. You need to put on the new self. You need to do better clothes. We must change our better clothes for better clothes. We must change our natural vices for supernatural virtues. And here Paul mentions three. Be kind. Be tender-hearted. Be forgiving. Three things. Kind. I think a lot of marital problems will be solved if we do those three things. Be kind, be tender hearted, and if we forgive him. This is the remedy for bitter clothes. This is how you put off the old clothes. This is how you walk in the spirit and not gratify the flesh, the desires of the flesh. Put on kindness. The Greek word for kindness is Christos. Almost the same word as Christos, but it's just the E in the I. Some people say, playing around with words, Jesus was kind. He was Christus, was Christus. And it literally means to fit, to be fit for use. That's what it in Greek means, Christos. To be fit for use. In other words, to be kind is to be useful. To be serviceable. Being kind is more than just be friendly. I know friendly people... But to be kind is more than just that. It is the capacity to show goodness, to be useful and serviceable. It is more, it is more volitional than emotional. Now, William Barclay, I like to read his commentaries. You're more than welcome if you can find him online. William Barclay. Do you know William Barclay, Pastor God? Great sermons. Great sermons. I love to read them. He, he says that kindness has learned the secret of looking outwards all time and not inwards. And there's the problem. Bitterness, anger, wrath, all these things come when you only focus inside. 
Kindness, tender heartness, forgiving is really focused on self. It's not selfish, it's selfless. So our biggest problem is the self. Put on tender heartness. Now I like this word because it comes from, well the word he uses is ishplachnos, and it comes from two words. It comes from you meaning well, and splachnon meaning bowel, your, your inner your bowels. Okay? Now literally, it actually means to have strong bowels. Literally. But metaphorically, it refers to be, to be healthy inside. To be strong inside. Tender heartness. Okay? I like the word because I, when, when, when I read the story about Jesus, when he, he, he Matthew chapter 9, I actually have it on, online. Let me read it to you, Matthew 3. Chapter 9, 35 says, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. And then verse 36 says, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. It literally means his inner bowels were moved. It moved. Because the inner bowels was considered to be the seat of emotions and intentions. If you study the Old Testament, you'll find that the heart is the mind, refers to the mind, but the bowels refer to emotion. Now we've got the other way around. In Western thinking, we talk about the heart, we talk about, oh, my heart is broken, emotion. Okay? But the Bible refers to heart as the mind and the bowels as the emotions. Where David says, my, my inner, my how do you say that in English? Intestines are on the... He's explaining his emotions, how he feels. And here Jesus comes, he sees the crowds, and his inner bowels move. He has compassion. I always made a joke and say, when I saw Lizelle for the first time, I had splunkitsu. Okay. My inner... Maybe that's what they call butterflies. You know, the goes. But this is what happened. He saw them. He had compassion. That's what tender heartness means. To be well compassionate. To be healthy inside in that sense. But metaphorically to have compassion. I don't know if there's some of the translations that translate it with compassion. Tender heartness with compassion. I'm not sure. What's the translation? Uh, NIV. NIV it says compassion. Yeah. Tender heartness. That's what it means. Jesus never lost his compassion. Jesus never lost his tender heartness. Men scorned at him. Men spat on him. They crucified him. And still he prayed to his father, saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's compassion. Can we do that? Yeah, we struggle with that. But we need to put on better clothes. This brings me to the third one, and that's um, the forgiveness. Now, I know forgiveness is something I can, we can probably preach on many sermons, just on that. Um, but let me say this. There is a myth about forgiveness that says, and I hear people say this, and I just want to clear this myth. It says, even pastors say this. I don't know what Pastor God is going to can agree or disagree, but I hear pastors say this, but I, I don't think they're right. They say you must forget in order to forgive. Have you heard that? You must forget in order to forgive. Now, I don't believe this is true. Let me explain why. Forgiveness is not forgetfulness. When God forgives me, he doesn't have a tumor on, you know, understand. He forgets. It doesn't mean that. The Bible says he just never, he doesn't think about it anymore. He chooses to take our sin, throw it in the deepest sea, remove it as far as the east is from the west, puts it in the deepest sea, and then he puts on a little sign that says no fishing. That God forgives, he, it doesn't mean forget. Now, forgiving is remember, and this is important. Forgiving is remembering without bitterness. 
You can only say, I truly forgave someone when you remembered what they did to you and you don't have bitterness or anger or wrath or slander. It's remembering without hatred and without resentment. It means I will not remember what has been done. I will not allow that event or person. Uh, uh, sorry, it means I remember what was done, but I will not allow that event or person to make me bitter. That's true forgiveness. True forgiveness gets rid of anger, gets rid of bitterness. It's not memory loss. The Greek word for forgive, and this is an interesting word, is the word charizomai. It comes from charis, meaning grace. Charismatis. You have told I word for that. Charismatic. It's, that's where charis um, comes from. Grace. It means to give Grace. That's forgive. And I like the word in English because the word, the last four letters says, give. For give. To give grace. To extend grace. Now I'm going to close. Now I want to ask you this question this morning. And I'm, I did ask you, but I'm going to ask you again. Do you want to be better? Or do you want to be better? The only reason why we are bitter is because we cannot forgive. We cannot forgive what someone did to me. Now, now this is personal. Maybe there's things going through your mind saying, Pastor, but you don't understand. I understand what the Bible says. You must forgive. Bitterness is the poison of unforgiveness. Now, text says, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. And just before you say, I can't do it, it's impossible. Paul says, as God had in Christ forgave you. If God, who has received the greater offense, can forgive us, who have been offended far less, we must forgive one another. It is because we've experienced God's forgiveness that we now can reflect that. If we put on Jesus, we will be able to forgive. Is it a little bit loud now? If you put it a little bit soft. As God's love produces our love, we love because He first loved us. As His love produces our love, God's forgiveness produces in us the ability to forgive others. No, I can't. Yes, you can. Because God gave you His Spirit. God gave you everything you need. You can forgive. I know you can. It's just an excuse. If you struggle, realize how much He has forgiven you. It is out of the wellspring of his person as God in Christ forgave you. It is in the wellspring of his person that we are strengthened by the spirit in our inner man that we are able to forgive. And I'm asking you this morning, maybe this is the spirit prompting you this morning to allow the spirit of God to humble you to hear what God's grace has done for you. Allow your, to, hear the, uh, uh, to, to be humbled by His grace. Just think about what you deserve and what you should be punished for. And God forgave you. Think about those things that God has forgiven you for. You know what the best thing is? This is the practical thing I'm thinking now. The best thing you can do for someone that you have really bitterness towards is to start pray for them. Start pray for them. Ask the Lord if they're not saved to save them. Confess your anger quickly. Ask the Holy Spirit to, to control your mind, emotions. Don't let bitterness creep into your heart. Ask forgiveness. Give forgiveness. 
every day, every day, when you get up, when you wake up, you have a choice. I'm going to put on the bitter man or I'm going to put on the better man. That's your choice. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We know that this life that you want us to live is not a life that is impossible. Yes, Lord, we are sinful. We make mistakes. Sometimes we walk with bitterness in our hearts, anger, slander, wrath, all these things that we heard about this morning. But thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you, Lord, that Jesus Christ showed us kindness, showed us compassion, showed us forgiveness. We've got an example we can follow. And I pray that your spirit will soften our hearts. And Lord, help us to put on Jesus Christ. Put on the new self so that our lives can reflect your love, can reflect your forgiveness. And by our love for one another in the context of the church, as Paul is actually talking about in Ephesians 4, in the church, when brothers love one another, the world will know that you are God. May our love towards one another, may the unity in the church be a testimony of your grace and your mercy and your love and forgiveness. I pray that in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Maybe this was a little bit of a longer sermon, but that's okay. We're going to use communion. And um, obviously we can't pass it out, so I'm going to ask that we pray for the communion and then invite you to come to the table one by one, obviously not everyone at the same time, to come and just, uh, get the bread and um, the grape juice. And when we all have it with us, we're going to pray together. And we're going to use it together as a church. Amen. Um, who can I ask? Ush, will you just bring table of the Lord for us before the Lord. Let me just close this. Can I ask you to come and stand here for the people online? I'm just going to explain. We're going to use communion together. If you're at home, you can join together with your family and also do that at home. Um, so um, you're more than welcome. Just pray for us. Just